who dream about the future. And here I have a stellar panel that I'm honored uh, to introduce to all of you. And uh, we will hear each and every speaker. Uh, we will have two keynote speakers who will have um, a presentation with um, more points to further be discussed by the panelists. And we will then open uh, a floor to questions from the audience. So let me start from uh, Dr. Ulana Suprun, uh, who is the acting minister of, um, of the Minister of Health. She's courageous to chair the ministry and still believes that a lot can be done to improve people's health in this country. Um, let me also introduce uh, to you uh, Mr. Edward Norton, who is coming to us um, no, not from Hollywood, but from even a more exciting place, from the University of Michigan, from the School of Public Health. And um, I'm sure Edward has a lot to say about uh, what is happening in other countries, and uh, we can match ourselves to the global patterns. Um, we also have um, an interesting panel, a quite diverse panel. So. I will proceed uh, by introducing to you uh, Mr. Sergei Berzenko, uh, who is um, uh, a, a member of parliament. And Sergei is actually doing a very difficult job of not only coordinating uh, as a deputy chair one of the biggest political bloc in the parliament, but also being a member of the health committee. And I actually don't know which work is a more challenging one. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Um, I will also uh, be delighted to present uh, Mr. Tavilai, uh, who works as a senior policy advisor in WHO. Uh, Tavi is uh, uh, Estonian, and uh, he used to work as a scientist, epidemiologist in Estonia. Um, he also seated in the Ministry of Social Affairs, which is an equivalent to our Ministry of Health here in Ukraine, and did a lot of work to help Estonians to become healthier. Uh, Tavi came to us from Kazakhstan, so he's also having a lot of exposure to other systems and countries, and we'll be hearing from him uh, today as well. Okay, so we also have uh, Dr. Vasil Lazarishinets. Uh, so you, you hear, uh, we have a practicing doctor, a manager, uh, who is facing a lot of challenges from this provider side. So he is responsible for uh, a, a good uh, treatment, uh, for good conditions, from, for prevention of diseases, for happiness and satisfaction of patients. So it will be also interesting to hear from uh, Dr. Lazarishin about his insights and inputs. Um, now we move to Olga Stefanishina, uh, uh, who is an executive, the executive uh, director of the NGO called Patients of Ukraine. Olga is probably one of the persons who is proud to call her, herself a patient. And, uh, and really represent the rights and demands of patients in all different occasions. Um, I know that Olga tirelessly speaks about the patient's needs and rights, and uh, she never fears to talk about that in public. Uh, she spoke uh, recently directly to the president demanding for the health reforms. So, this is the person who is really inspired to ask for more in, 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 in what we have now. And um, my neighbor in the panel uh, is Volodymyr Spivak, who is a, a corporate communication, communication director. director and uh, no, uh, yeah. yeah, there is a long title. I tried to memorize. I, sh I was sure that I will have a problem. But yes, thank you, Volodymyr. So we have a representative from the private sector here. And as you uh, see, we really try to collect a variety of different people, and we hope that we'll have a very uh, fruitful exchange of ideas and uh, opinions of uh, where we are and how we are going to move ahead. 
So it's time to turn the mic to uh, Ulana and to ask her to talk to us and to explain uh, what is happening, what is going to happen, and what we all have to uh, be aware of in, in developing the better and healthier future for Ukrainians. Thank you, Ulyan. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? It's on? Yes. Um, thank you for the introduction and also for organizing this panel because um, each of the people here has their own unique effect on the reforms that are happening in the, uh, in the healthcare system. Um, we have international experts, we have practicing physicians, we have uh, patient representatives, we have those that represent uh, private industry, and very importantly, we have deputies of our parliament who will be, I anticipate, voting for the health care reforms in the next couple of weeks uh, under the leadership of uh, our, uh, our friend Sidhi Berezenko, who actually has spearheaded in parliament the medical reform. He's not a physician, he's a patient, but his dad is a physician, and he, and he, and he understands uh, what the needs are in both the, from his father's side, from the physician's side, medical workers, as a patient, and also as a politician. So um, I did want to thank Sidhi for being here today, and I hope that the discussion we have will help guide him in um, helping the other uh, deputies understand how important health care reform is in Ukraine today. As Olana already said, Ukraine's health care system is in pretty bad shape. We live 11 years shorter than most of our European neighbors. Um, about 136,000 families go bankrupt every year paying for their health care because the system doesn't provide enough financing for them. A lot of these things are all about money. We talk about how um, increasing, uh, increasing a life expectancy by one year can increase GDP by 4%. We talk about how um, decreasing uh, the uh, risk of corruption by uh, one standard deviation on the World Bank uh, registries can uh, decrease infant mortality by 25%. And there's all these numbers that we talk about that talk about financing. But in reality, healthcare is about people. It's about making people healthy, keeping them healthy, and helping them if they get sick. And one of the things that really bothers me about a lot of the healthcare reform is all we ever talk about is financing. We don't talk about the quality of care, which our doctor representative here can tell you is very important. He's a cardiologist, and those things that happen in cardiology really depend on the, uh, the training of the doctor and uh, whether the patient listens to the recommendations of the doctor or not. We need to stop talking only about financing. We need to talk about quality. People matter. People matter, and patients matter. However, our health care reform does start with financing because at this point, people aren't getting guarantees of the financing of their health care when they become ill. We're not spending enough money and putting enough attention on prevention of disease. Instead, we're concentrating mostly on treatment of disease. Those issues are what we're trying to battle with the health care reforms. The first part of it is changing the way we're financing the system. Up until now, we finance the system where we uh, finance the existence of hospitals, the walls, the people who work in the hospital, but not, not the services that are provided there. The change in the health care financing will now provide uh, for the financing of services. Uh, the people who most uh, support us in the Cabinet of Ministers is the Ministry of Finance because they're finally going to know where that money is going. Right now, this money goes into this big black hole of uh, the healthcare system, and we hear from patients that they're paying for everything themselves. Even though we spend billions and billions of hryvnias on the healthcare system, most people pay for much of what they do out of their own pockets. Most of their care comes out of their own pockets. So now we'll be able to actually follow where the money goes. And as we know, wherever the money goes, we can also keep control over the quality of care that's given and whether the proper care is being given to patients. That's a really important change that's happening in our healthcare system. And that's the law, um, the uh, bill 6327 that's up in parliament for, for voting. The other part of our reform of healthcare isn't talked about much. That's the concept we put forward on public health. 
That's what our colleague here from the University of Michigan, who by the way is a rival of Michigan State University, where I actually did get a medical degree because I am a doctor despite what the internet says. Um, I practiced medicine for 15 years and yeah, I think that uh, you can attest to the fact that Michigan State University does have a college of human medicine that releases physicians Absolutely. that are MDs that practice medicine and it's not where uh, nurses come out of only. Yes. It's there just a coincidence. We didn't plan it. <laughs> we have a Our waitress. international partners uh, confirm. Um, but what we're also talking about is public health. Most Ukrainians don't know what public health is. We don't even have until recently, education in public health. We didn't have university programs that taught public health. We don't have professionals that work in public health. Just one year ago, we started the public health center in Ukraine. Well, what is public health? Public health is caring about the health of all the people. It's, it's uh, keeping people healthy. It's making sure they're vaccinated. It's making sure that we don't die of cardiovascular disease, but instead we have medicines that we can take every day to treat our high blood pressure so we don't have a heart attack. It's cutting back on smoking, it's cutting back on drinking. It's keeping us living longer, healthier, and better lives so that we don't become disabled, but instead we are cured of disease if we become ill. Public health is a very important part of a healthcare system, and it's been completely ignored for 25 years in Ukraine. We're starting to talk about healthcare in a public health sense, and we've developed both a um, uh, public health center as well as many programs that will help with keeping people healthy. One of those programs is accessible medicines, Dostupni Lieke. For the first time, there's a reimbursement program for those who have cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and bronchial asthma. You get a prescription from your doctor, you go to the pharmacy, you hand in your prescription, and you get your medicine either for free or with a low copayment if you choose a more expensive medicine rather than the least expensive one. This has provided five and a half million prescriptions. This has provided a 23% decrease in pricing of medicines, and this has increased use of medicines for cardiovascular disease by 62%. That 62% in the next couple of years will translate into a lower mortality rate and a lower rate of disabled persons. You won't have people with heart attacks, you won't have people with strokes, you won't have as many problems with, uh, with uh, amputations when we treat type 2 diabetes, and we're going to see a quick and massive improvement in quality and length of life just from a simple program. A simple program that in terms of budgets was quite inexpensive, 500 million hryvnia, compared to the 55 billion hryvnia that we spend on our subvencia. These are the kinds of things where you can make relatively small financial investments into the health of people. And that's what healthcare is. It's an investment in people. I was on this show called Svoboda Slova, I think it is, on uh, Odin plus Odin, and we were asked, ICTV, and uh, the, there were four journalists that were asking us questions, and we talked about uh, education reform, we talked about pension reform, we talked about medical reform, and the journalist said to us, you keep talking about all the, the reforms that all they do is take, up, take money away from the budget. How come you're not talking about investments? Frankly, all of those are investments because they're investments into people. They're investments into our population. When we have healthy workforce that can work, they pay their taxes. When you have, as we have now, less than 50% of the population in our workforce, you have problems with your taxes. You don't have enough financing for other programs. When you have good educational programs, when you have a school that teaches people to think and practical knowledge, not just knowledge where they can pass an exam, you're investing in the workforce of the future. When you're investing in pensions, when you're giving people a better pension, you're investing in the quality of life after retirement, and you're allowing people to live longer, happier lives. All of these are investments. We have almost a million people working in the healthcare system. That's a million jobs in Ukraine. It's not a drain on the economy. It's an investment. It's an investment into people, into our workforce, and it's also an investment in the country and it's an investment in our national security. Because people who are sick and who are worried about how, who's gonna pay for them or their loved ones when they get sick, 
They're ready to be bought by and listen to anybody that will help them. People who are healthy, people who have guarantees from their government will support their government. They will stand for their country and they'll stand for their rights. Those are the kind of Ukrainians that we want to have. And that's why we're investing in people. Our health care reforms are patient-centered. The patient will choose their own doctor. The patient will choose their own hospital. The patient will choose what kind of medicines they want to take in a reimbursement program. And not only patients get benefits from this, the medical workers do too, because the doctors will now be employed by nonprofit corporation hospitals, and they'll have their patients standing behind them. There'll be a competition for the best doctors. Doctors will have higher salaries because now they'll be paid for the number of operations they do, the number of patients they have, not the tariff system that's in a government program. And they won't have to mm, beg for a job and a position in a hospital. Instead, hospital directors will seek those physicians that have a wide patient base and those that are most popular with their patients. So doctors win, patients win, and we as a country win because we'll have healthier, happier, longer living patients in our workforce that will be paying their tax hryvnias into our budget, we'll be able to then educate more children, we'll be able to provide more health care, and we're making an investment into our country and into our national security by reforming our health care system. I know that many people here have their own opinions about how the health care system works now. I think all of them agree that it's not working. We need to move forward. We need to take the first step and start changing this system so that by two years from now, three years from now, five years from now, we're talking about the way the system is now in the past. That's the only way we're going to move forward. So I hope that the parliament will vote soon on Bill 6327 the bill that's supported by the patient organizations, that are supported by many associations of physicians, that are supported really by the Ministry of Finance and those other members of cabinet who understand what's happening. And in the end, it's also supported by the president. As you know, most recently, there's a new one and a half billion uh, program, one and a half billion hryvni program supporting uh, medical services in villages, because as in every country of the world, there's a big problem in providing health services, health care services in villages. The president is also coming on board with all of this reform, and I think that in the end, we'll be able to provide better quality services at, uh, with financial guarantees for all the patients of Ukraine, and many of us will, know, will not be patients because we will stay healthy. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ulyana. And um, yeah, we have a lot of speakers, but I will still ask a question uh, uh, and I will address it to Ulyana because people matter and we want them to matter even more. So what do you think people have to do to matter in the health system? What do they need to start doing right now differently or um, to start doing even more in a more intensified way. What do you think, what is the role of the patient in, in the whole transformation circle that we are in? Um, right now, only about 20% of, of patients have a primary care doctor. That's a, uh, um, a family practice doctor or a pediatrician or a general practice doctor. And about 80% of patients go directly to a specialist or don't even know any doctors. Um, in most of the rest of the world, it's flipped. 80% of patients have their family doctors, and that's where primary care is given. That's where most of medical attention is given. And only about 20% goes to specialized care. So one of the first things patients can do is find a primary care doctor. Find a family doctor, a pediatrician for your children, a general practice doctor. And um, is starting from January 1st, we'll, we're uh, asking patients to sign a declaration with that doctor so the doctor gets paid directly for each one of the patients that they should take care of for the whole year. That doctor will provide many services for you, which are screening for disease, also as many visits as necessary during the year if you do become sick. There are also laboratory tests that are provided and consultations for any questions that you have. They will also provide you with prescriptions. They'll also provide you with um, uh, uh, work, uh, 
sick leave uh, um, list ke. And those are the doctors that you really should refer to first. So what can you do now? Find your doctor. Find a doctor that you like, ask your friends, go to your local uh, ambulatory center, and start signing up with doctors. Because if we see our doctor on a regular basis and he knows us, that's already the first step to being healthy. Now the second thing is find out information about what's changing in the healthcare system so that you're, um, you know what to do next. You know what your rights are, and you know what the obligations are of the physicians of your departments of health, and also what the obligation is of yourself. Because each one of us is really responsible for our own health. It's not the responsibility of the country. It's not the responsibility of some doctor. We can only help. Each of us is responsible for our own health. It was very interesting, the difference between, say, the Soviet model of medicine and Western medicine. Um, uh, the um, patriarch of the Ukrainian uh, Greek Catholic Church, Svetoslav, is a doctor. I don't know if most of you know this or not, but he's trained as a doctor. And he said when he went to medical school, he was taught that the health of the citizen belongs to the state in the Soviet system. It doesn't. It belongs to you. And each one of us should take care of ourselves as well as our loved ones and take responsibility for our own health and not wait for somebody else to do it for us. The first step is finding a good doctor so that you have someone that you can ask questions of and who can help you to take care of your own health. Great, thank you, Uliana. So finding a doctor is a must and uh, we, also, we all need to know our rights, right? So to, to really uh, make sure that uh, we matter as patients. But um, talking about responsibilities of governments and what governments can do and uh, what the governments are doing and whether they are doing this right or wrong, um, I would invite uh, Edward to talk on this and uh, help us understand what is actually expected from a good government and um, what is an efficient and effective government structure in health. Good, thank you very much. I do have some slides, if we could bring those up. Um, I'm an economist, and I must say it's wonderful to come all the way across the world and find another person from Michigan. Um, and uh, what I want to talk about today is bring together ideas from economics and from the discussion of well-being that this conference is about um, and how well-being can, uh, how the role of government in improving well-being. So well-being, of course, um, includes the idea of both quantity and quality of life. And uh, so the question then, uh, particularly for Ukraine, is how can, how can Ukraine um, improve the quantity and quality uh, of life that people have by, uh, for example, um, decreasing the amount of pain people have, giving them more mobility, improving mental health, not just physical health, uh, so that people can live and work and be with their family as they want to be. Now, Ukraine is obviously not a developing uh, nation. If you, if you think, though, about a very poor nation or a nation from 200 years ago, what would you do to really improve well-being, that is, quantity and quality of life? Clean water, treat the sewage, vaccinate, uh, now that we know about vaccinations, um, against infectious diseases, and improve infant mortality. Those are sort of the four most basic ways to improve population health. Um, but uh, nowadays with modern governments, I want to uh, talk a little bit about what is the role of governments in improving population health and, and well-being. Now, traditionally, um, economists argue that the role of government is often uh, to take over when there's market failure. That is, when a traditional market uh, that we have for many, many goods and services doesn't work, that there are things people want to buy and sell, and for some reason the market falls apart without government intervention. Or when there are externalities, which is a fancy word, uh, for when one person's behavior affects somebody else possibly in a positive way, but usually we think of in negative ways, such as pollution. Uh, so two great examples of these are health insurance, uh, particularly for the elderly. If, if you, the, the, 
um, even in the United States, where we have a very bizarre health insurance system, uh, even in the United States, we have government-sponsored health insurance for the elderly, because without that, there would be no market. It would all break down. Education for children is another that uh, people just wouldn't invest enough in their own education um, uh, than people want. So. Once you find markets where um, governments, uh, wh where there's market failure and government has a role, the sort of four important ways that governments can influence things are through taxation, information, regulation, and negotiation. A few examples. Taxation is often used to try and uh, correct prices or um, include negative externalities. That's often the reason given to tax cigarettes is because uh, cigarettes impose uh, costs on, on other people, so let's raise the price. Information is very important. Um, governments can collect information about things like nutrition or hospital ratings and collect it in a uniform way and provide that information to, uh, to consumers. Regulation um, can help uh, enforce proper behavior. For example, uh, Pharmaceutical companies left on their own probably would not test their drugs in as rigorous a way as they, they do with uh, regulation. Um, and negotiation between countries is important for dealing with matters of international importance, including uh, what happens when there are outbreaks of infectious diseases. Um, now, a lot of health economics has focused on uh, what's often called behavioral health, that is the, the issues of smoking and drinking and diet and exercise, which directly affect people's health and their well-being. Um, it affects uh, mortality and how long people live and also how happy they are while alive. And so for these things, it's, it's fairly easy to think of of specific ways government can influence these markets, taxing cigarettes and alcohol, um, providing information on cigarette packages that smoking is bad, that smoking kills and should not, pregnant women should not smoke, regulation on cigarette ads or, or smoking in public places. Um, for example, with diet, there, uh, at least in the United States and I think in many countries, the agricultural industry is subsidized in various ways. Um, there's information on nutrition labels, there are regulations about what counts as an organic brand or chemicals that can be added or not added to food. Um, and then, of course, there's negotiation between countries uh, about importing and exporting food and tariffs and so forth. But I want to also raise a number of what I would call bigger issues that uh, are really important for public health. Um, and go way beyond the very important issues that Ukraine is dealing with now about setting up health insurance and having it properly financed. But these are also issues that I hope the Ukrainian government keeps in mind um, because these are ways that um, the government can also greatly affect population health. One is dealing with natural disasters. Um, so the, the past couple of weeks, the United States has been hit with two historically large hurricanes. One hit Texas, one battered Florida. Texas got hit with more than a meter of rain in, in a very short amount of time in Houston, and there was tremendous flooding. Despite the incredible uh, wind and rain and destruction from the hurricanes and destruction of many, many buildings, very few people died. There were almost no deaths. It's really remarkable because of the role of government in, in getting information out and getting people out of harm's way um, in a way that uh, 100 years ago there was a similar storm and 30,000 people died in Texas in a, a similar kind of storm. Um, Dealing with pandemics and very contagious diseases uh, that have come up in, in the last few years um, is also uh, extremely important. Not only um, the chronic illnesses, uh, but, but the diseases that have, have out, um, great outbreaks. Pollution is something that I wish, I, I'm afraid my own government is uh, becoming more lax about. but. Uh, uh, more and more studies are coming out with the importance of air pollution on neonatal health um, 
uh, pollutants getting into the land and the water supply affecting the health of people. Uh, these are very important issues that, that the government really has to take the lead on. Transportation, in the United States, there are almost 40,000 people a year who die in, in automobile accidents, traffic accidents. Um, and again, there's a role for the government in improving the safety for improving public transportation um, and bike lane. There, there are a lot of countries in Europe have much better uh, bicycle uh, support, which uh, helps health as well as reducing pollution. Um, <clears throat> I've heard some talks recently about end of life and how with modern Western healthcare, there's so many resources that are sometimes thrown at people who are really near the end of life and for whom the marginal benefit is very small that people end up dying at enormous expense, in great pain, alone. All the things you don't want and nobody wants, but somehow we end up there. And, um, and that, is, that is an area uh, where a lot, of, a lot of Western medicine really fails when you think about the quality uh, of, of life. And finally, war, negotiation between countries. I don't need to tell you more about that. Um, uh, but that obviously is very important to prevent um, war. What does not work? I spend a lot of my time, my research time, focusing on these issues because these come up a lot in the United States. There's a lot of effort spent on screening, which has um, low or negative returns uh, on average. Things like report cards and pay for performance programs, which are these wonderful ideas for how to improve quality of care and may eventually uh, work out. Um, pay for performance is actually being used around the world. These are great ideas that have very modest, at best, uh, improvements in quality, at least to date. Um, and then there are a lot of other ideas about big data and things called accountable care organizations and personalized medicine, and which sound wonderful and yet to date have really um, not worked well in practice. So I hope that as Ukraine moves forward, you can focus on the, the really important things where you get the most return um, on your investment. So uh, just to conclude quickly, the role of government is strongest, the, the motivation for the role of government is strongest when there are market failures and externalities. Um, there are a number of ways that the government has tools to uh, do things to improve health or, and, and to correct these market failures. Um, and there are very important issues that that apply to population health that go way beyond hospitals and doctors. Although I'm not diminishing those issues, but there, you should think of population health and well-being um, in a much broader term than, than just hospitals, um, with the goal, obviously, to improve population well-being, the quantity and quality of life. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. This gives a great framework and a lot of points that we can start discussing with our panelists uh, because, of course, we all understand that uh, ev every government is trying to fix failures, but of course, there are also failures that are made by the governments themselves. And of course, uh, it's a lot of things that are defined in the process of what is working, what is not working. And sometimes the most important thing is to start doing things and to start learning from, uh, from the uh, lessons and from the experience. Um, so really, like uh, we now open the uh, session for a quick um, uh, reflections on the presentations of our keynote speakers. And um, I would uh, now uh, look uh, at uh, Sergei Berezenko, who is actually a part of the government and uh, will know of the parliament and uh, also governs what is going to happen in, in Ukraine in, in the next, um, in the future. So I understand, uh, Sergei, that um, you sit uh, in the parliament and you have to select from so many priorities. And you really also need to define what, what really matters to people, what should be improved, uh, and what will be the impacts. I know that you are an economist, it's then I also understand that you think in big economic terms when you um, uh, define what, what are the priorities and what are the reforms that need to be. So um, let us hear from you. 
why do you think health reform is important? And um, what will happen if the reform is not uh, uh, is not started right away, like, or just to put in the bigger context, like what the reform is going to bring, uh, good and better uh, for the country, for the uh, uh, country's well-being and economic well-being, and also for uh, better destinies of Ukrainians. Uh, thank you very much, Olena. First of all, I'd like to thank for uh, con this conference organizers who invited me here and uh, uh, give me a floor to uh, discuss uh, such important issues as uh, people, uh, public health and uh, healthcare reform. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, healthcare reform, new medical reform, will be. Uh, uh, first of all, because Ulana uh, doesn't allow us to say something different in <laughs> Parliament. Uh, and uh, we have almost 230 MPs who understand that uh, uh, this uh, thing will be uh, inevitably. So <laughs> we are just waiting for the date when we will have an opportunity to vote for this reform. Thank you. Uh, uh, this applause is for Tuliana first of all, because uh, her team uh, initiated this process and it's very important and, and actually it's essential thing of what we should do in healthcare committee. And each MP uh, being the member of healthcare care committee uh, should remember uh, 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 their role um, that those people, um, the MPs from different faction should understand that healthcare reform, pension reform, education reform, uh, it, some um, essential things that will change the country. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, uh, quantity of those who support this idea is much bigger than a uh, uh, group of those who are against it. Um, I have some uh, notes just to be uh, just to be concrete and um, to be clear. Um, and I was thinking actually uh, on one question: What does a person who suffers from a disease feel today in Ukraine? Uh, unfortunately, I understand that they, uh, they have two feelings, uh, and these two feelings are dominating: it's despair and fear. First of all, uh, this man or woman who is uh, going to the hospital is afraid, first of all, to go to the doctor uh, because uh, isn't sure or, um, of, the, of the motivation of this doctor. He's not sure that this uh, in loyalty of the doctor and uh, often even incompetence of the doctor. Uh, but most of all, uh, this guy is afraid of not to have enough money for treatment, especially in the uh, rural, rural uh, area of our country. Um, today, the life expectancy of Ukrainians, uh, as uh, Ulyana has already mentioned, is almost uh, 10 or 11 years lower than average in, in the Europe. Just uh, think about this figure, 10 years lower than in the Europe. And we are going to be the members of the, Uni of the um, uh, European Union. Um, this is a consequence of an old archaic system which uh, has not provided the health of the nation for a long time. And we should understand that. Today in Ukraine, uh, not everyone understands uh, the need for the changes in the healthcare system. And uh, not everyone understands uh, its uh, inevitability. Opponent says that let's leave it uh, as it is. The majority of the uh, politicians, officials, uh, maybe not so loudly, but uh, while discussing this issue, say let's leave it as it is. Uh, they terrify people with the fact that the medical reform will only destroy the system, uh, but instead will not create a new one. And it's also true. But we should uh, say them stop. We can't uh, allow uh, even think like this. And we can't postpone uh, it anymore. Uh, because it has become uh, mortally dangerous. Uh, uh, as far as I understand and as far as I feel, it's uh, mortally dangerous. Um, 
our healthcare system is not just sick. Actually, um, uh, everyone feels that it uh, completely destroyed. And our task is to change it for the present and the future generation. Um, people matter. Uh, we have these words in the name of the conference. And I think we, we could uh, um, also, with these words, define the essence of the uh, healthcare reform we are talking about and we are trying to represent. And what are the main principles of this reform? I, I'll try to uh, describe it very briefly. First of all, it's payment for services, but not for the walls. Uh, we strongly reject the old Soviet system that we should finance beds in the hospital. Money from the state budget should go not for uh, covering the abstract hospital beds, but for actually provided medical services. We call it uh, money follows the patient. Um, the second principle is the freedom of choice. Uh, we provide the free choice of a family doctor to a person. And the cost of the doctor's work for patient will be delivered from the budget. The third principle is the prestige of the medical profession. And it's very important because doctor will receive the real motivation for professional development and for growth. And revenues of the healthcare workers uh, should be directly dependent on the level of their proficiency. Uh, so the better, doctor will, uh, um, the better doctors will attract more patients and they will receive more money, more salary. The first principle is the fair and uh, the effective finances. We established the, um, uh, we used to say that uh, guaranteed free package, but in general it is uh, a guaranteed free package of the services as the main part of the governmental program. And within this program, a person should not pay anything to anyone, so um, he shouldn't pay for pills or other medicine. And it's also true, because uh, we have um, another point of view of our opponents. They say that we will pay for everything, and it's not true and it's not fair. Um, so uh, to sum up all about mentioned, uh, I'd like to say that uh, it's very uh, important to have such platforms uh, such uh, uh, conferences and such audience because uh, we need your support, we need your advocacy and we need you to be public. You should go and speak. You should uh, discuss this issue and you should understand that we are lying on the bottom. We are not, uh, mm, we, we won't uh, change anything uh, without uh, um, changes in the approaches. Uh, now we are paying for, for example, if we will um, compare the expenditures on the health care in Ukraine and in Poland, you will see they, that they are approximately the same. Uh, but at the same time, Ukrainians now, with, uh, uh, with uh, this system as we have, according to the uh, 49 article of the Constitution. Ukrainians pay for more than a half of the health care services, while Poles pay just for the, uh, uh, for the third part of it. And 70% of the expenses are covered by the state there. So we need, uh, and, and the fifth, um, uh, I'd, I'd like to, to emphasize that uh, we need economic independence of the medical institutions because this, comp uh, this competence, this competition uh, will be, um, allow clinics to, de to develop and uh, uh, attract uh, nice doctors, nice physicians, and create new system of the healthcare in Ukraine. So our goal is to create a healthcare system which uh, will provide Ukrainians with high quality services, will uh, raise the prestige of the medical uh, profession, and uh, ultimately will contribute to the improvement of health level of the nation. I uh, entirely sure that we have strong will to um, uh, implement this reform. We have support of the president, we have support of the government, we have support of the civil society, of our international partners, and I hope we will uh, get a support of the Ukrainian parliament. Um, and uh, we have everything we need. We just need will, we just need your support, we just need to be public. Um, I'm, I, I repeat this because it's very important, and in several weeks, I hope that we will succeed. 
and I hope that we will build new healthcare system and build new healthy country. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Sergey. Um, it's it's really uh, great to hear that uh, the parliament is keen and eager to vote, and that you just need to know the date, which is probably tremendous news for all of us. And uh, it's it's also very inspiring to hear that. Uh, you so strongly believe that um, the change is inevitable and that people will feel the difference, uh, really, and that uh, there will be a lot of improvement uh, in what people get, what they can expect from the system, uh, what they know uh, about the guarantees of the state, and uh, how they treat themselves in, 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 in this whole continuum of care and uh, uh, provider and uh, customer um, relations. Um, we would like uh, now to hear from the doctor, uh, from uh, Dr. Lazarishinitz, um, who is, um, I'm sure, one of the big supporters of the reform, because doctors also understand that um, there is a need to change something, that something works wrong, and uh, that uh, probably we need to change uh, views, change attitudes, also change the mechanisms that are in place. So my question would be uh, to uh, Mr. Lazarishin is, um, is what is the role of the doctor and how it will be different 10 years from now um, in, in still Ukraine's system? Like what is a good future and what is the place for a doctor in this future? I'm sorry, so, but I'm not prepared uh, my lecture by English. Ukrainian, I will sorry. speak Ukrainian. Uh, my uh, well, um, my presentation, uh, my presentation actually was about the role of cardiology and cardiac surgery within the public health because you know that's a very big problem. Dr. Uliana, along with the other different speakers, uh, was speaking today about uh, losing per year like 400, 410,000 uh, Ukraine citizens, uh, which makes like 68 percent within the mortality ratio. And that's an epidemic, and we need to struggle with it. I simply wanted to say that this despite the fact that by today, by today, 38 cardiac surgery centers, we have 20, 28 of them operate, uh, perform an open heart surgery, and uh, in total that makes 19,000 uh, surgeries, uh, 27,000 uh, coronarographies, uh, and uh, uh, the, the 27,000 standings. Uh, is that uh, much or little? That's 13 percent compared to the U EU level, and uh, we're doing three times uh, less uh, surgeries than in Europe, uh, four times less than in Australia, uh, six times less than in the U.S. Uh, if recalculated uh, as per million of population. However, uh, within the public health structure, um, institutions also uh, pertaining to cardiovascular, uh, they uh, only uh, I count for 10 to 15 percent. Uh, uh, that's 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 ecology, 45 percent. That's the soil we're living on. That's the air that we're breathing. That's the pure water uh, that should be around. And that's also our lifestyle and our diet and all the rest. So. Um, uh, certain studies were conducted that demonstrated that um, only only due to the uh, modalities and approaches they were going to use, like from the point of view of ecology, environment, social methods, lifestyle, diet, we uh, potentially can, uh, by 75 percent, improve um, our um, public health condition. Uh, um, the simple um, pressure taking. Uh, with a patient uh, provided for uh, the stroke rate going down by 37 percent. And you know the uh, stroke rate, which makes uh, more than 37,000 per year, then measuring the sugar level, blood sugar, that gives you an opportunity to improve your lifestyle. And the last thing I wanted to say is uh, that uh, the right point was made today. Only 20 percent of uh, health care is provided on the primary level. That should be reverted. That should be. Uh, <clears throat> that should be flipped over from the uh, top of the side. So uh, that was spoken about at a conference that uh, was held uh, at National Medical University, chaired by the President of Ukraine. Uh, actually, uh, 
I, I, I've got a different, I, I beg to differ. Um, even if the uh, MPs um, vote for the medical reform, and I'm sure they will do, the reform is uh, not likely to uh, gather speed at once, especially at the primary level, because the uh, biggest drag will be the doctors, the uh, providers, the doctors and the health providers. And I will explain why. That will be because uh, we uh, gave too little explanation to the doctors of what we want to do in the periphery. And secondarily, the doctors do not have the proper conditions uh, for uh, better life. So uh, let's set up some conditions and terms, and let's uh, provide for a bigger salary to the doctors about the work. And let's also uh, clarify to them that um, the Ukrainian citizen, actually, thank God we, uh, we've just had decentralization. And in certain regions, uh, um, already uh, there are um, communities, um, area related, and uh, they start working, uh, like patient communities, and they will understand what particular doctors they will need, and they're ready to pay for that, and they will also ma make it clear what particular services they will need. So uh, we, have, uh, on our part, from the Ministry of Health and uh, other structures, need to support those territorial communities and need to work with them. And the last thing to be said, that in any country, public health and population's health and, and Ukraine's population's health, and uh, we're talking about 10% less life expectancy compared to the EU where we want to go. Um, but anyway, we need to invest money in this. So uh, uh, we've we got a war going on now, but um, um, what are we going to invest? Like 2.5%, 3%, the, the max rate um, was like 3 to 4% of the GDP in, into healthcare. Nothing will there be, uh, because WHO uh, and the representatives of which are here now they, 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 in Ukraine, if we invest less than 5 percent, they claim uh, the nation will go extinct, which is going on right now today. As uh, per year, uh, we're losing like uh, 630, 640,000 uh, Ukraine citizens, out of which 86, 85 percent, uh, that's uh, more than half a million. Over, over one year, over two years, uh, we, we'll lose a city of Dnipro Petrovsk called Lviv size. So uh, unless we invest hard and properly in health care, then, then, then we're doomed to, to be extinct gradually, step by step, but we are. And I assume that it is thanks to conferences like this one, and thanks to the efforts of the Parliament and the Ministry of Health, uh, we will we'll hopefully uh, manage to avoid that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Vasil. Um, I um, can't disagree with your idea, uh, so um, uh, when we're going to drive the, uh, the draft to the second trading, and uh, um, it, it stipulates uh, some health care expenditures, like 5 percent of the G GDP. Uh, so when, when it comes to voting for the next years, uh, we're planning to uh, allocate, uh, like health care allocations uh, will be about equal to the Army budget right now, and that's very important to understand all this. So thank you very much, and I hope Hopefully, uh, uh, that the war will be over in the near future, and there will be an opportunity for the state to allocate that kind of money to health care. And another thought on top of that, that the Academy of Th Medical Sciences and the institutions like Institute Strzhevsky and Amosov Institute, we have developed a cardiovascular program agenda for the next five to ten years, uh, because otherwise nothing will be there. And uh, I would like to ask Dr. Suprun uh, to, uh, as soon as possible, consider our program, the agenda, so that we uh, move further, because uh, that's the tertiary reform, not, not actually primary, secondary, that's the ter tertiary level of reform. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, your contribution, and uh, I would, we would like uh, to actually uh, deal in more detail with what Mr. Vasily said, as uh, we need to set the priorities, and uh, we, we actually need to understand the uh, uh, proper directions to the allocations of budget, and uh, why, why are the Ukrainians dying early? They're dying early not because uh, the system is uh, uh, malfunctioning, uh, not, not, not providing 
providing good response to their uh, needs. Uh, we, we have not enough prevention. We have plenty of smokers, uh, and uh, as the people themselves uh, aggravate their health condition. And, and that's also uh, because the government needs to pinpoint the right priorities and uh, to the need to properly respond to each of those challenges um, that, that there are pretty complicated and the fine points to that and hopefully the floor will develop further questions but we, we need to move on um, because uh, um, we're going to have a slightly longer session if, 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 if we move just as slow as now um, so we need to speed up um. and I will invite um, now Tavi to um, to speak and um, what I want Tavi to do is to imagine that he's back uh, into his ministry chair in Estonia or in any other country you, you choose. Uh, so my question to you would be, what would you do differently in that time when you were in the chair? And what you think uh, uh, Estonians should not do at that time or other countries did uh, in a wrong way? So what are your uh, lessons learned and what are your awareness about failures? Can you uh, speak about that, Tavi? Wow, what a question. Thank you. Um, yes, I worked in the Estonian Ministry of Health um, for seven years, so I could talk about my personal experience there. But at the same time, I'm also by heart um, a researcher, so I did a literature review, very short one, about um, how different donor organizations uh, can support countries because I'm representing WHO here and, and we're working with the Ministry of Health every day. So what can do, what can donor organizations can uh, do better and, and uh, what are the, what is the best environment for a donor organization to work and support the country and how the collaboration can be most successful. And um, learning from bad experiences, so I'll relate to, uh, I'll relate my research findings to my pers personal experience as well. So while working in the ministry, different consultants from different donor organizations were coming to the ministry regularly, quite often. And a lot of them were telling them that the student needs to do this or needs to do other thing and everyone seemed to have a solution and and there were so many different assessments and uh, different experts coming and going and new ideas and telling us what to do. So quite a lot of the people in the ministry, including me in the beginning, were quite um, annoyed that um, experts come and go and we need to survive here and do the reforms and Kind of earn our money and not get fired from the ministry, etc. And now I'm in the international organization, and uh, it's kind of ironic for me. But uh, working in the ministry previously has been a good learning experience. So, for donor organizations and ministries working with donor organizations, as and providing support to the countries. As always, it's a question of um, complexity versus simple solutions and quick wins. These need to be balanced somehow. Then what literature also shows, and uh, my personal experience, is who is leading the process is one of the important things. Um, our complaints while I working, was working in the ministry were coming from the fact that we didn't have a good idea what we wanted, and uh, organizations and the internationals came and told us what to do. Um, but when we turned it around, um, things improved. With this kind of coming and going, um, many countries seem to have, um, and I've been to one, which is not Ukraine, of course, uh, there's this thing called assessment fatigue, too many information too many assessments, too much information, so you don't know which one to follow, basically. And um, that country in Balkans, I'm having in mind, basically told the international organizations, you do what you want, um, 
we live our life um, as we want, and, um, but on paper everything looks good. So another Balkan country did, um, based on different uh, suggestions, free reforms on primary health care in a sequence without waiting uh, what the previous reform uh, was, what results the previous reform was, was giving. So now they have a very strange system which doesn't work at all because uh, they listen to everyone. So where I'm leading with this is for in, in working in a donor organization in a country like Ukraine is always a very kind of thin balancing act, being there and supporting, providing the opportunities to support the information, but at the same time not telling uh, that you have to do something that, or threatening, or the process needs to be country led. And at the same time, doing this kind of balancing act, sometimes we get, our, we get burned as well in a, in a way that because we try to keep on the background, so we're not visible, so sometimes we hear that we're not doing anything, but um, maybe it's true, maybe it's not, um, but it happens. So based on literature and my personal experience and speaking with colleagues, etc., one of the key things that lead to good international donor rate support is when the process is controlled very clearly. So the country needs what are the priorities. And in defining the um, priorities for a country, it's always good to have uh, this kind of comprehensive sector policy. It's a paper, true, but at the same time, you can take the paper and then negotiate with donors saying that um, you do this part, the other organization does that part, and then you can monitor and follow up uh, the donor organizations as well, have you done it? So I know Ministry of Health is constantly asking from us, have you delivered that, have you done that, um, etc. But I think uh, personal experience, as I was one of the authors of Estonian National Health Policy, the overall health policy, is I like policies and I like this kind of framing of, of the sector activities. And what this kind of framing of policies also gives is a sequencing of uh, reforms. Today it's a benefit package, primary health care, changes in and secondary care, hospital care. Today, as a switch from input-based financing to output-based output uh, financing, but then again, having seen many countries, me personally, maybe not that much, but my colleagues, older colleagues, uh, who has done and helped different reforms in different countries for much longer time, they kind of see what's probably coming next for example, from output-based uh, financing to financing well-being, or trying things like pay for performance, which by the way, one reason they haven't been improved to work is that everyone is doing it differently, because all the countries are differently, so basically you don't have anything to assess, and research findings are not there just so. So improved integration of different services uh, one of the minister said that about public health and healthcare integration, but it's also social care and other aspects, and how you exactly do the integration to start with medical education, etc. This kind of things, if a donor comes into country and has this kind of overall framework with a long-term view with what's coming next, then it's easier to support but in the end, working, been working in the ministry, I can absolutely understand that there's always that firefighting, today's crisis that you need to solve, and it's really, really difficult to come out of that and do a long-term plan. Sometimes I've been thinking that often enough myself that it's not possible to do such, such a plan. But then again, on the weekend, sometime you have with your family a good quiet moment, 
you come up with a brilliant idea and then you go to the work and tell your people that, let's do it. It sounds like you really need sometimes quiet moments <laughs> to Absolutely. start doing something that matters. And one thing, as I mentioned about the Balkan country, one important thing is seeing the reforms through to basically do what you planned. An example, in one um, Central Asian country, they did perfect primary healthcare reform, they had a sector policy, priorities for donors, for themselves, but then again, somewhere, somehow, in policy, political discussions or whatever, the plans and implementation plans changed. So basically, the reforms didn't continue on to the logical conclusion, the comprehensive system changed, so they changed one component. So basically, in the end, the system as a whole didn't start working on producing the results. So it's about comprehensiveness, thinking about the future steps, sequencing, um, getting the, all the help you need um, or can get, um, including international donor organizations, and getting the re input and results of everyone measured and then improving based on that toward um, future that's peop where people matter, not only patients, but people. Because before you get become a patient, you're always a person. Toward a system that um, improves the quality of life and the well-being of everyone, where everyone is uh, engaged, where patients have a voice, and every second and moment. So. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Tom. we have our fingers crossed uh, for Ukraine because we see Ukraine be moving to that. Yeah direction. That's yeah. great. We talked with Tavi before uh, starting the session and I promised that I will show him when his time runs um, off, but uh, now he sits so far away <laughs> that I cannot really show. But thank you, Tavi. That was a very insightful uh, speech and um, the key takeaway messages that I would like to reiterate is that um, do what matters and do what you plan to do make sure that you um, complete the circle, you move on with your agenda, and think what's next, so that you also understand what are the next steps and how to build uh, on the achievements or, uh, again, uh, lessons learned from what you did. And um, international experiences really give a lot of evidence and the rich uh, cases of what went well and what went wrong and uh, uh, unfortunately the uh, bad cases is that when countries do start good ambitions uh, reforms but never complete them they never uh, are able to learn from from the whole cycle because um, there, there were no results and also they start developing fatigue from uh, from trying to implement change, changes, but never changing uh, something. So I think this is very useful. And uh, with this, I would like to move on to uh, Olga, um, who is, um, uh, as I said, who is a patient, who is a mother uh, of wonderful kids. Uh, by the way, Olga, did you, you vaccinate your kids? Of course, I was uh, <laughs> lucky enough to do it uh, five and eight years ago. <laughs> so now, Great. yeah. I so uh, I, I would like Olga to share with all of us uh, your dreams. Um, what would be um, a system that um, will comfort your needs, uh, your your kids, your friends, your neighbors, your parents? What will make you happy and proud uh, if you start seeing as a change in our system? I will be very short. I know that uh, we are finishing. Uh, I know I was thinking about um, ideal situation for the patients, uh, for the patient, uh, for, for a person in Ukraine. Um, and I remembered some talks with our members uh, discussing um, situation in Ukraine, situation in healthcare, and you know. I think that uh, we all will be pretty much happy when we don't know the name of the Minister of Health, for instance. Why? So we're just 
go to the hospital, we get service and we are satisfied and we don't think, oh, this is Mrs. Supreme, what is she doing? Why is she doing this? All TV news are showing uh, some terrible situation in the country about uh, procurements, about um, their intentions to do some very harmful reform. <laughs> because we all are now watching TV and even my mother told me recently that, oh Olga, what is going on with this reform? I watch TV and I'm not sure uh, that it, it should work. Um, yes, this is our reality today, unfortunately. And I really don't want it to be in 10, for instance, years. Now we uh, can uh, see on the, on the screen our uh, survey results, and uh, uh, you will see that only 3% uh, of people which uh, were um, in our target audience got free drugs from, from, from the state. Uh, almost 100% of people pay for it. Uh, 52% of Ukrainians uh, don't go to doctors. They don't trust the medical doctors and they don't have money to pay for it. So they do uh, self-medication. 43% um, of Ukrainians used to sell uh, property or got into debts trying to pay for treatment. 49% uh, of Ukrainians quit treatment because of poverty. So. Um, these are the numbers, and uh, I'm, a, as a person who is uh, dealing with patients every day, I, I see those people who don't get treatment every day. And uh, um, now uh, I'm in a bit um, untypical position here because uh, I, I have 10 years experience of working with different uh, patients organizations, and we got used to uh, criticize the government. Patient got used to go to the Ministry of Health with demonstrations, actions, demanding for, uh, for the reform. And um, today I'm sitting here and uh, I'm like in a dream because uh, there is a Minister of Health uh, here in Ukraine who wants to do the reform. And we are supporting this reform and this minister um, for, for the first time in, in ten, 10 years of my experience. Uh, we have uh, members of the parliament, not all of them, <laughs> but the best champions who support the healthcare reform. And uh, I think uh, this is a part of uh, change which, which was brought by the revolution of dignity. Because, uh, and I understand that uh, we will not see the result of the reform immediately. I'm, I'm perfectly aware of that. But I see this change and um, I see this hope which is brought um, to our patients now when we understand that um, the laws will be approved in a couple of weeks, maybe in a week, maybe, <laughs> maybe some, <laughs> some earlier. Um, and we are waiting for it. Uh, and um, what I wanted to say uh, to the audience, and uh, maybe have one more uh, slide. Uh, can, can, uh, yes. So, uh, the laws which are now in the parliament underwent um, a range of discussions and criticizing. And uh, for me, um, it's, it's very strange because uh, the idea, the philosophy of uh, these laws um, is very simple and it's very logical. The government will stop paying for walls and will pay for services. For those walls, the government will stop paying. Uh, I'm very um, big... Um, uh, I take positively the ideas of uh, bringing much more money to, to healthcare, but uh, if we don't do this reform, we can uh, put uh, billions of dollars in the system, but it will not work because we don't pay for service. We pay for, for these walls. And uh, I don't know if those members of the parliament uh, who criticize the reform have been to our hospitals. Uh, but their populistic um, uh, statements uh, 
didn't let this reform go through the parliament in May. Uh, and they already almost uh, did, are not passed in September. So um, for me, it's very important uh, to say that um, all of us, we are all people, patients here in this country, and we should just uh, look into facts and read the laws and uh, understand the ideas which are brought by, by the ministry, by, by the government, and really uh, discuss it with our communities and explain to our mothers, fathers, and even kids that uh, these reforms bring uh, crucial change. and. Um, Yes, maybe once uh, we will have co-payments, and I'm uh, I'm supportive of co-payments. I understand that a lot of members of the parliament say that um, it's not uh, a violation of the constitution of Ukraine, <laughs> which is saying that we all receive uh, free medical uh, care, which is not true, and. Um, I think that uh, we all should understand that a first step of uh, reform of primary care is very important and hopefully it will be started in, uh, in next year. But uh, it's also important to start the reform of secondary care and third care and uh, that will be the moment when, when we all will understand that we will be changing even these laws and we will, uh, we, we will we'll be introducing those co-payments to to boost uh, our system. Um, I'm uh, not very often visitor of uh, uh, hospitals in Ukraine, but uh, I have kids and I have uh, my parents. And I have a case when my father uh, almost died in Ukrainian hospital just because the doctors didn't care. Uh, he was just crawling on, uh, in the hospital asking for help and uh, we had to call for our friends and bringing money to the hospital and we paid a lot and we paid for everything. Um, so, um, and it's not a unique case. I, I'm sure that 90% of people here understand that this system doesn't work. So, um, I really hope that uh, those promises given by the president, by the government, by members of the parliament uh, will come true very soon. We will have the laws uh, preceded by the government, by, by the parliament. But we should understand that it's the first step and we will have a lot more to do and overcome this populistic uh, environment which, which exists in our parliament and uh, which actually makes obstacle to the reform. Great, thank you very much, Olga, for an inspiring speech. <laughs> and now I pass the floor to uh, Volodymyr, who patiently waited for his time. Uh, and uh, sorry for delaying a little bit this session, but I hope you are still motivated to stay with us and to um, wait until we open it for questions. So, uh, Volodymyr is here to uh, talk to us on behalf of the private sector. Um, and, um, of course, there is a role for every stakeholder. So, there is a big role for the private sector to be a partner in what the, what the government, what the patients, what the doctors are doing, and what the public health programs are uh, suggesting to us in terms of uh, uh, maintaining good health, preventing diseases, and uh, supporting healthy lifestyles. So, uh, Volodymyr um, will describe what what is already been supported by Nestle, but I also want him to tell us what potentially can be done uh, in even a bigger scale, uh, thinking about the importance of health of, uh, of, of, of people and um, what we should ask or expect from the private sector to, to, to do in this regard. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much that you invite me here to speak to this uh, auditorium. Uh, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I cannot speak uh, so professionally as my colleague here. I'm also not from the parliament. Uh, I cannot vote next week. For, for <laughs> oh, but uh, what I want to tell, I believe that all of you agree that uh, food industry 
uh, have a big impact uh, on our society overall, and especially for people's life in case of a healthy uh, future. And uh, if we're talking about uh, Nestle, uh, already in purpose of our company, uh, we have commitment to enhancing quality of life and contributing to the healthy future. Uh, all that we do is connected with our, uh, with our creating, uh, creating shared value uh, concept. For sure that uh, we do the basic things like the proper information on our products, uh, our in, uh, information about all ingredients for products for kids, uh, according with our very, very strict Nestle rules that encoding with the World Health Organization. But uh, we think and we see beyond uh, all this. We believe that uh, as a big uh, food company, uh, we can uh, have uh, impact on future uh, development of uh, Ukraine. We are uh, Nestle in Ukraine, and we are a company who's worked inside our uh, country. And we try to choose from this creating shared value initiatives, ex uh, initiatives exactly this thing that's most important for our society, for Ukrainian people. I don't know, uh, uh, nobody mentioned this, but I believe that this is true, that this statistics that we have, that uh, uh, astroenterological diseases uh, between kids, it's on second score already in Ukraine. And the number of kids who has overweight, uh, who have overweight is growing, unfortunately, from year to year. Because of that, uh, uh, we decided to have a betka harchovanya, to introduce in Ukraine a betka harchovanya. Actually, uh, this is inside Nestle Healthy Kids program globally. It's uh, 80, uh, Ukraine, one of the country from 84 different other countries where we have different kind of progress, uh, programs in this area. But in Ukraine, our betka harchovanya was uh, launched in 2009. And this is a special, pro special program uh, for kids for primary school. We believe that primary school exactly is the right time where we can uh, teach uh, kids uh, how to eat properly. Because if these habits that we can give to, the, uh, our, to our children, we will do in earlier, in, in younger uh, uh, years, I believe it uh, Will, good, uh, will develop in future, and when they will grow, when they will adult, they will take this experience, this learning with them, with the future life. Uh, for sure that uh, it is many other areas, but I believe where food industry can be involved, but uh, already since 2009, uh, for, uh, we involve more than 1,300 schools around all Ukraine to this program. It is more, it is more than 3,100 uh, uh, kids was um, or still uh, uh, inside or involved to this uh, program also. So uh, I believe that this is our impact uh, to uh, the society and to, to this uh, topic. Um, it's uh, actually it's everything from my side for. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Valdemar. Uh, yeah. As, yeah, as we can see, private companies can do a lot and they can do large-scale, impactful programs as well. And healthy eating is a big and very important topic. And uh, Edward also mentioned that uh, there are different policies to encourage healthy eating, discourage unhealthy eating. And of course, um, everything starts uh, in childhood and uh, a lot depends on how parents um, think about the health of their own selves and also about the health of, of their uh, children. So people matter and health matters everywhere, like in, on, on different levels, in every family, in the school, uh, in the parliament, uh, in, uh, in a hospital, in, uh, in the World Health Organization, in the University of Michigan. And it's, uh, it's really important that we are here and talking about that. Um, uh, I was going to let speakers um, um, discuss or add a little bit uh, on, on the uh, discussions that were already held, but I will not do that. I will uh, open uh, now the session for questions right away. 
and um, we will do the following. I will ask you to, to, to uh, think about questions and we will collect three to four questions and we'll try to answer them in batches. Um, if you know who you want uh, to ask your question to, then name the speaker. If not, I will look for volunteers or maybe somebody will want to volunteer to, to uh, respond. Um, I hope you have questions. I mean, there were a lot of interesting things um, uh, presented here and um, also maybe a controversial things, I don't know. So um, tell us, what is, what is your question? Uh, can you raise your hand so that we can approach you with the mic? Great, yeah. Let, yeah. I have a question to the minister. Uh, the man from Nestle uh, starts from the pr primary school, but people start from the pregnancy. So we need a betka for mothers, for grandmothers. Is, is it in the minister some program to educate, to deliver knowledge to the people because the world changes and yeah. we need to change our habits? Okay, uh, the next question. I will not yet open it. Hello. I have if possible, two questions uh, to Minister Ilana uh, Saprun. First of all, I would like to thank you all speakers because it was great, and especially to Mr. Norton for clear presentation of what is public health, and Mr. Lazarishnitz for clear understanding what what is public health. And my question is about public health center. Uh, Ms. Lana mentioned that it was uh, established already more than one year ago, and uh, as I can judge from public information that available pub publicly, uh, it, it is still concentrated only on TB, HIV, maybe some infection diseases, but not on broader picture for public health, as mentioned Mr. Norton, uh, on uh, chronic diseases and at yeah. least Natalia, that, your question. Oh, sorry, yeah. my question: What is happening? If there is plans to develop public health center more actively, and the second question to Mr. Spivak: uh, Does uh, Nestle go into uh, reject trans fats in your food? Okay, great questions. Okay, we have questions from uh, behind the uh, audience and then um, also a hand from Lilia in the center. So let, let us collect these two and then we start answering Thank them. you for amazing discussion. It's very encouraging and it's very important for Ukraine finally to have a discussion on public health and the role of the state and economy. Probably everyone will agree that tobacco control is one of the most successful cases in terms of the public health interventions, and we are moving to the tobacco end game. Therefore, I would like to ask a question. What are the obstacles to strengthening tobacco control legislation in Ukraine? We know that the last anti-tobacco legislation was adopted in 2012. So now we have a need. So I would kindly encourage you to share your thoughts what are the obstacles to adopt two new anti-tobacco draft laws that we have in Ukraine since 2015 and 2016? Thank you. Thank you, Lilia. I, I guess you would ask parliamentarians to speak on that. Okay. Uh, and the last question before we start answering. A question to Ms. Saprun. On average, uh, the Ukrainian expenditures uh, stand at the level of uh, 1500 $2,000 uh, per, equivalent per year. So uh, will that money, is the question, be available to every person like a contribution, like a premium for um, um, for actually, uh, for the medical insurance, the insurance fee, actually? Uh, so it, uh, it otherwise, um, it could be uh, 15 to 20,000 because if we take a normal uh, insurance fee, that would be 15 to 20,000 per person. So our medicine is not capable of that. So uh, if, if you have that idea, um, then the, why don't you think about that? Uh, um, uh, first, I would like Uliana to address the questions of pregnancy and public 
Actually, the Call first center. two questions uh, are related to each other because there is a new policy on nutrition for all, uh, uh, all Ukrainians from pregnant women to babies to uh, young adults to elderly. And that has already been submitted to the Cabinet of Ministers and it's going through the, um, all of the uh, uh, different ministries and it should be approved uh, in a Cabinet of Ministers meeting soon. And that nutrition strategy was formed by the Center for Public Health. Uh, there is an entire program and half, more than half of the center actually is on non-communicable diseases. That's something that our friends from WHO have really stressed for a very long time, that in Ukraine, all of our public health is concentrated, you know, any public health we had was concentrated only on infectious diseases. So there's an entire section of our uh, public health center that is on non-communicable diseases. Um, for tobacco, uh, I'll have uh, Sidhi respond to that question, but I'll say tobacco industry, but maybe so, there are some other uh, blocks to, the, uh, to that um, uh, legislature that we're waiting to pass. And for the um, insurance question, um, the health care reform that we are proposing when it comes to financial guarantees for provision of medical services and um, uh, medications is creating a national health insurance. So we're not going to take 2,000 hryvnia and pay it to a private health insurer that then is for profit and is going to make money off of this to find health care for their, uh, their uh, policyholders. But instead, we're following the NHS system, the National Health Service of uh, Great Britain system, where we're using government funds as the health insurance payment. So the same budgetary funds that now are put aside and support the walls will actually be paying for health care services. And because there isn't a private industry in between, there is uh, the cutting out of the additional charges that private industry provides through a, a health insurance company. This is the first step in creating a new health care system in Ukraine, the way it's financed. There, isn't, there is very little, as you can see, even sitting here um, in front, and the questions that are asked by the audience, there's very little understanding of what is health insurance. Health insurance is payment for services. It's insuring the health of people, paying for services, paying for preventative disease, uh, preventative measures so that you don't get sick. Um, we're creating a health insurance, so there is no reason to take money from the budget that people have paid in taxes and pay a private health insurance company to provide healthcare services for people. That actually would be the most inefficient way, second to the way that we provide healthcare now. So I don't think that's the right way to go. If we did provision, if we had our citizens buy health insurance, we would then make it say tax exempt. We would make it as part of their pay when, uh, as it is in many countries, a portion of, um, of the taxes paid by uh, the employers is actually paid into a health insurance policy for their employees. That would be a much more efficient way of doing it. So we're not considering that because I don't think it's a very efficient way of doing things. But in time, I believe that there will be a much uh, larger proportion of um, medical insurance in the sense of private medical insurance rather than there's government medical insurance provided for our citizens. As Olya was saying, a very important part of the law which we had put in place in, in originally where there was a copay associated with um, uh, specialized and, and um, hospitalization, specialized care and hospitalization, was removed by uh, the working group that worked on it in parliament before it was put for a second vote. Um, that copay portion could very easily be covered by private health insurers. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing that we're thinking of a German, uh, more German model where there's partial uh, payment by government, partial payment by um, uh, employers for private health insurance, and in time we'll be able to move into that. But at this point, we don't even have an understanding in Ukraine of payment for services. So we need to take our first step before we, we need to learn how to walk before we learn how to run. And that's what we're trying to do now. Thank you, Ulyana. It's, it's a great discussion. And if we, were, if, we, if we were at the Health Financing Forum, I would love to elaborate more on that and uh, ask different opinions. I'm sure Edward has a lot to say on that. But um, let's focus more on like uh, overall well-being topic and um, uh, uh, public health uh, things. That's uh, the smoking um, legislation is uh, 
very big and important part that uh, actually helps to um, to react to the market failures and to really um, uh, promote uh, healthy behavior and change behaviors when they are not healthy. So if you can say what is the level of support in the parliament, do parliamentarians understand the importance of these acts? Um, or what are, what are the kind of prospects for, for the coming changes in, in this part of the legislation? Actually, uh, I think this uh, tobacco legisla legislation, new tobacco legislation, has uh, quite high support in Parliament, and it, this legislation will be adopted. But uh, first of all, uh, we had small discussion before the panel, and uh, we made an agreement to receive uh, this uh, draft uh, bill uh, you have. Uh, is it ready to the first reading or to the second reading? And we will uh, push it in the parliament and uh, receive these uh, uh, positive votes. But uh, in this case, we have uh, uh, objective and subjective circumstances. Because, uh, for example, first of all, objective is that we are now in the process of uh, implementing um, uh, the final part of uh, judicial reform, uh, changes to the civil code. And, for example, in this uh, legislation, in, just in this legislative document or in this bill, for, to the second reading, we have 4,500 amendments. Uh, that means that we need uh, six or seven more days just to hear these amendments, not even discuss them. Um, it's also the way how to uh, stop the reforms, how to stop the adopting of um, important uh, things in the parliament. And this is the, also the tricks of the opponents. Um, after that, we will have uh, medical, I hope, uh, medical reforms, reform and uh, pension reform. And uh, I really hope that till uh, the end of the November, we will uh, have an opportunity to discuss uh, if it's necessary, if it's needed uh, in committee, and after that uh, go to the uh, parliament and discuss it um, while um, voting for that. That's why we'll start with um, uh, information, with the material, with the plot of the law, and after that we'll deliver it uh, to the whole. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sergei. Uh, Lila did the homework. I see that uh, Sergei is prepared to answer. Uh, now the question is to Volodymyr to talk about uh, trans fats and how Nestlé is dealing with that in their products. First of all, thank you again for the question, uh, because I was expected that all questions will be to the minister. <laughs> it's nice that you also have a question to private business. Already nice. And for sure, the trans fats uh, is very hot topic. Uh, during, uh, I mean, I saw it in media a lot now, I, I believe all of you also uh, see it. Uh, actually, Nestle uh, had commitment to eliminate all trans fats uh, from our products till 2016, and we did it. Especially uh, trans, fat, trans fat that uh, partially hydro, hydrogenated fa uh, fats. And we eliminated, as I said, uh, completely uh, in all our products, not only in Ukraine, overall, uh, in 2016. But we still, for sure, some very small, very, very super small amount of uh, fats uh, in, uh, for example, confectionery uh, products even here in Ukraine, but the amount on this uh, transfer is uh, less than natural, for example, in meat or dairy, and much less. So this is my answer. Great. Thank you, Vladimir. That's the pleasure when the private sector really reacts to global trends and global demands. And of course, um, these pressures and uh, uh, to really think about healthier uh, lives and healthier foods uh, is important to have and to also communicate with everybody to have um, an adequate response. So thank you for Nestle, to Nestle that you already did it. I see more questions. We follow the same rule. We collect questions and then we answer them. So ladies in the back. Dear friends, dear friends, we are very, we are very grateful to the organizers 
Uh, we're very grateful to the organizers for um, actually raising um, such a uh, um, uh, such pain, painstaking problems for Ukraine, uh, uneasy problems for Ukraine. But I have a question for Oliyana Supron, our minister of healthcare. And uh, the point is, we're sitting here with teachers, and we're teaching our students uh, that the state, the state is a state for. Um, executing certain functions, and uh, among the most important function is the preservation of the nation, the preservation of the people's health. This is why, Miss Oliana, I uh, really disagree with the fact that the state is not responsible for nation for the nation's health. Um, it should be. Um, another point is uh, what methods, what modalities, because our the decision makers at the cabinet, at, at, at the parliament, they have to uh, have certain criteria of uh, efficient performance, uh, which I don't see as performance as such over the last years. And by the way, our Ministry uh, of Healthcare pertains to that. So if people keep dying, and uh, what I want to tell you, the state as bodies like Ministry of Education, Ministry of uh, Healthcare sh should bear the responsibility for the performance, should be performance responsible, not just saying everything is bad and going haywire. So, so the state should assume the responsibility for the nation's health. So uh, we're just collecting the questions. We don't have any time for further comments. So just ask your questions. Do not comment. Uh, the question concerns uh, the uh, the reform. I mean, what the task you have set in front of you are mind-boggling, really, to understand in which direction to go right now. But I have a question regarding the procurement system. For now, uh, we have the national-level procurement transferred to the international organization, and this is the greatest achievement that we have seen the procurement system reform in Ukraine for years. But the question concerns the local level, I mean, the regional level procurement, and you are sitting, the word quality is right above your head. For now, we have just one criteria for product selection, that is the price. One, the word quality will be used to select the products for the population for Ukraine, for the public funds. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I saw one more question. Uh, thank you for the presentations. I have actually two questions. Uh, you, some of you mentioned education of citizens as very important for public health. And uh, now I think that it is really necessary to examine real situation in the education because even many uh, textbooks for public schools contain totally pseudoscientific things, even uh, textbooks of Ukrainian or very different subjects. Yeah, they contain uh, pseudoscientific propaganda, actually. And uh, we cannot do anything with the Ministry of Education because they support pseudoscience. Probably you should join us and help us to do something with them. And second question, uh, maybe, it's not a question, but um, I have some experience uh, of work in uh, aid projects long ago. But, but the main pro problem of these projects, because they try to reform legislation, they try to reform things are, that are obvious, they, they try to reform things as they are presented to the donors or as they are presented to these consultants. But they do not study real things and they do not try to reform real things. So please uh, take into account that uh, the things that uh, you have presented to you are very different from the reality. Okay, thank you yeah. for your questions. Um, uh, those who were brave enough had the chance to ask the question. We have no more, no time for more questions. So these are Olena, the can final Olena, answers. Can I have one really quick um, question? Unfortunately, I haven't seen the the the, uh, the hand, so I consider there was no additional question. Or it, uh, no, I just I just want to if the at the end we have a little bit of time, I would like uh, to hear from the team from the ministry, what you 
Have you actually had a chance to spend a weekend to think of the longer term perspective? And suppose that the parliament does vote for the reform very soon. What are the next steps for two, three years to go? Okay, great. Sorry, Elena, I thought that, <laughs> that it's not you who are going to ask the question. Okay, so we have final questions and most of them are uh, directed to uh, Ulana. Uh, so we ask Ulana to, uh, to answer them um, and um, then we'll conclude the session. Uh, when it comes to uh, what, uh, what the um, country or the national government is responsible for, um, it's for providing a system uh, of uh, guarantees for our citizens so that we can uh, keep them healthy and also to care for them if they become sick. You misunderstood what I said. I didn't say that the national government is not somehow um, responsible to help patients, help our citizens be healthy or provide care for them. I said that uh, in the Soviet system, the health of people belonged, was the property of the government. That's not true. Your health is your own property. The government provides the environment so that you can stay healthy and uh, provision in, in the way that uh, the new healthcare system will work, provision of services to treat any illnesses that you may have and to help you become healthy again. That's the new responsibility of the government. Secondly, um, I don't, I don't um, agree with the fact that the current Minister of Health is responsible for the mistakes and the problems that happened over the last 25 years. In the last year, we have transformed a lot of the procurement processes. We've provided over five million prescriptions of medicines for free for people who have cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, those that have bronchial asthma. We have provided a new system of financing which has been held up, I'm sorry, in parliament, and it would have passed a, long, a few months ago, and we would have already started the process July 1st for changing the financing of healthcare. I believe that in the last year, we've done more in reforming the Ukrainian system than has been done in 25 years. So I don't agree with you that uh, the Ministry of Health has been sitting and doing nothing for the last year. What happened 25 years before that is not my responsibility. It's the responsibility of those people, those 22 ministers who sat in place and those governments that changed ministers every year and didn't even allow them to work and change anything. That's a problem. Um, so that's my response to the first question. Second, press, procurement, big success with international organizations. I agree. And a second portion that a lot of people don't really think about is that we've also introduced a lot of new quality medications into Ukraine. New medications that are now registered here and at very accessible prices. So we have not only improved the, at a national level the procurement, we've allowed uh, through uh, registration of new uh, quality medications for even at local levels for them to be able to purchase those medications at uh, good prices. Um, yes, one of the problems in the procurement process of Prozoro is that it only looks at price. The procurement process of international organizations does not only look at price. There are criteria, and part of the criteria are quality. We have now put an, uh, into the, has already been accepted, or already, but already been voted on by the cabinet of ministers, our strategy on uh, uh, creating our own Ukrainian organization or um, agency that will be doing uh, national procurement of medicines and also will be helping our local governments and our local hospitals to procure medicines as well. We're taking the uh, good practices of the international organizations who've actually formed a secretariat and are now helping us to form our own agency so that we no longer will be looking at only price, but we'll be looking at the whole picture. We'll be looking at price, we'll be looking at innovative medicines, we'll be looking at the quality of the medicines, and of course, whether we're able to um, uh, create impact with provision of those medicines on the health of Ukrainians. So those, all of those are complex. Um, it's a, it's a, not a simple process, it's actually a very complex process, especially with um, medications. 
Um, education of children, I agree with you. There's a really big problem in many of our textbooks. And uh, they, need to be, uh, they need to be reviewed, and we need to put in current, <laughs> modern ways of thinking. Um, uh, say one of the things that we had a big problem with, uh, and this is a problem that we're having with industry right now, is uh, in most civilized countries, folic acid is added into uh, flour. And that prevents neural tube defects, which is defects in pregnant women on their babies. In Ukraine, uh, folic acid is added to flour for export, but not local use. So the companies have it, but they don't put it in for Ukrainian women they just put it in for export. And it's kopike, kopike to put it in. But, you know, it wasn't traditionally done. And when we submitted it to the National Academy of Medical Sciences, the institute told us that we need to do a 10-year study over 100,000 hryvnia a year to see whether adding folic acid will cause some kind of overdoses of folic acid in children and things like that. And this is a problem sometimes with the way things are done in Ukraine. It's over thought, over, um, over um, complicated and bureaucratic, instead of just taking what's best in practice in general. The question of what are we gonna do over the next three years is another two and a half hour uh, presentation. Um, the law that is, is submitted in parliament that's voted on um, foresees changing the financing of uh, primary health care starting from January 1st, 2018. And over the next two years, we have pilot programs for um, financing certain services, uh, specifically uh, probably um, obstetrical services, uh, transplants of uh, kidneys, also he uh, hemodialysis as pilot programs in 2018, more pilot programs in 2019, and on January 1st, 2020, we completely change over to a different way of financing the healthcare system. But that's only the financing part of it. There's also very many changes that are happening. Uh, part of it is the change in procurement, but we also have created an, a new essential medicines list. We also have created a uh, new process um, in which we're um, allowing uh, Ukrainian physicians to use uh, international protocols uh, without them going through an eight-month process of being recertified here in Ukraine that they actually work. Uh, we also have an entire new emergency medical system that we're building. We also have an entire new rehabilitation system that we're building. Palliative care is one of the guaranteed services provided uh, by the National Health Insurance and we're creating uh, hospices, we're tr creating palliative care services, we're um, now providing uh, pain relief for children with syrup, uh, morphine and syrup, because it's for the first time we're providing that. We're providing um, uh, methadone replacement therapy, uh, new treatments for those patients who have HIV AIDS, those patients who have hepatitis C, uh, we're now providing for our tuberculosis patients ambulatory treatment rather than herding them all into a uh, tubo dispenser and creating uh, superbugs that don't respond to any of our antibiotics. We're going to be requiring prescriptions for all medications that are being uh, reimbursed by the national policies. So there's a lot that's going on, and that's going to happen over the next few years. Um, right now, all of those pieces are being put together into a, a major uh, reform of the healthcare system. And the biggest and most important message to take home from all of this is the new system puts the patient in the center of attention because people matter. And that's what we need to do in government. What Olya was saying, uh, that she wants to live in a time where we don't know the name of the, of the health minister. We wanna live in a time where the healthcare system works we don't have to think about it. We go to our doctor, we get a prescription, we fill our prescription, we take our medicine, we get sick, we go to the emergency room, we call an ambulance, our child gets the immunization without having to look for it and pay for it and call each other and find out what hospital has what medication and where can I buy this and you don't get your laundry list of stuff you have to buy when you go to the hospital. That happens to all be in the pharmacy downstairs for some reason at a certain price. And we just, the system works. Yeah. It'll take a while, but someday Olya's not gonna know my name. <laughs> well, she'll know my name because we're friends, but she won't know me as the health minister. Today we were at the Congress of Anesthesiologists and they put up a t picture of Tom Price. And they asked the audience, 350 physicians, Ukrainian physicians, do you know who this man is? 
and they're like, never seen him before. It's Tom Price, who's technically the Minister of Health of the United States. Nobody knows him because the system is working and they don't need to call the minister and write the minister on her Facebook page, where can I get Pentaxim? When can, where can I find this medicine? Because the system's working. So someday, Olya, I hope that you don't know my name or the name of the next minister or the next minister. I hope your children don't know the names of the ministers. And I hope that we all go home taking home this message. People matter. And the health of people matter the most. So let's think about our own health. Let's take responsibility for our health. Let's demand from our government that they also take the responsibility that we should be doing, that we produce results. And I promise, while I'm in the ministry, and while said he is in parliament, that we'll be doing everything that we possibly can to help the citizens of Ukraine, the patients of Ukraine, the people of Ukraine, because people matter. Thank you. Thank you. Right. These are precious words, Ulyana. Thank you. You did my job. You concluded the session. I have no moral uh, right to keep the panelists uh, anymore here. Although I, I'm happy that uh, the level of attention is so high, although we are in the end of the day. And uh, I am sure that communication needs to sustain and people want to hear more about what is going to happen and what they will get in the results of the reform and all the efforts that everybody is making here um, uh, from, from every different side. So thank you very much for being in this session. Thank you uh, to organizers who uh, organized this event. This was really great uh, work and a really great idea. And uh, the whole team of Kiev School of Economics did a lot of uh, uh, kind of work behind the curtains to make it happen. So thank you for coming. Thank you for staying with us. And keep your questions uh, for future. And we hope that we'll all get with good answers that you will believe in and we'll all hope for better futures where people matter. Thank you.